Agent Morris with the NSA. There is something real here. Did you believe that our government is in possession of the agents? Uh, absolutely, based on interviewing uh, over 40 witnesses over four years. And, and, and where? I know the exact locations, and those locations were provided to the Inspector General and switched to the Intelligence Committees. I actually had the people with the first-hand knowledge um, provide a protective disclosure to the Inspector General. Uh, biologics came to some of these recoveries. Yeah. Those could represent uh, exquisite new adversary technology. Non-human, and that was the assessment of people uh, with direct knowledge on the program I talked to that are currently still on the program. The government is covering up some level of its knowledge and understanding about what some of those things are. The Seoul Foundation, which just announced a new initiative for UFO research and policy. It's nuts, man. I mean, we're just small town buds who saw a UFO in the woods. I mean, now we're hanging out with the government. Wow. <laughs> what floor were you guys on? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another weekly live edition of Anomaly Now, straight out of Austin, Texas. I am your host, Miles Lewis. This is the weekly live media news roundup for the 501c3 nonprofit Scientific Anomaly Institute, a.k.a. the Anomaly Archives. Do the social media routine. Please, it helps the algorithms that rule our lives. Hey, you can find out more about us by going to our website. That is anomalyarchives.org. You can also go to our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash anomalyarchives. And you can find out all the ways that you can support us. You can subscribe for free and just get updates as you see fit. And uh, we are providing a live online lecture presentation from various Fortean paranormal anomalist ufological paranormal psychological weirdos seekers every month if you're subscribed at the ten dollar a month patreon tier that is the anomaly academy cadet level or higher and sometimes we give access to the lower tiers just because we're such nice people but yeah, that's over at patreon.com slash anomaly archives. And as you probably already know, you can go to our flipboard over at board.com slash at anomaly archives, and you can find thousands of links going back years and years and years to all the news articles that we often cover in this weekly show, or many that we never get the chance to cover because there's just too much news to cover. I was just telling our volunteer, Victor, that I think this poor little computer is overtaxed tonight because I've got so many tabs open for tonight's show and let's with that jump right in so i i must have mentioned this last week but maybe not or the week before that but back on uh september 17th the hill that is the hill.com reported senate armed services committee to hold ufo hearing so we've been hearing that there's going to be another hearing and chris kirsten Gillibrand, pictured here at the hill.com is been saying on and off the record that there is likely going to be another another hearing coming up very soon in the months to come. Of course, this would have been fantastic on the heels of the passage of the, what is it, the UA, UAP date, UAPDA, UAPDA, the UAP Disclosure Act, the bill that was introduced one, not once, not twice, well, twice, and then Apparently didn't go forward. So that that is the newest news. And I've only seen this reported here at liberationtimes.com. Paradigm changing UFO transparency legislation fails in Congress for second consecutive year. And if this reporting is accurate, it appears to be the fault of Senator Rand Paul. <laughs> so you can figure that one out yourself. But yeah, it says I hear the UAPDA's inclusion within the manager's package hinged upon support for the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs due to its potential oversight role and involvement in a controlled UAP disclosure campaign should it have been passed. However, sources state that the UAPDA UAPDA, failed to be included within, within the manager's package due to resistance from that committee's Republican ranking member. 
Senator Rand Paul. Liberation Times has requested comment from Senator Paul's office. The September 25th update. After initially declining to comment on the record via email, a staffer from Senator Rand Paul's office has now told Liberation Times through phone call that the senator cleared the UAPDA to be included within the package manager's package. Oh, wait. <laughs> In a separate phone transcript obtained by Liberation Times, a staff member states, quote, Senator Paul cleared that amendment, so any delay was not due to his actions. Notably, in 2021, Senator Paul implied that $22 million secured by the late Senator Harry Reid for a UAP program was a bad use of government money. I can think of many ways that are much worse than, than this, but this article over at Liberation Times goes on to say, it marks the second successive failure for the UAPDA, which was gutted by NDAA fiscal year 2024, due to opposition from multiple fronts, most notably Representative Mike Turner and other leaders within the House. Of note, following is gutting. Of note, following its gutting from NDAA F fiscal year 2024, Senator Schumer stated that multiple credible sources notified him and Senator Rounds that information on UAP has been withheld from Congress. Quote, we've also been notified by multiple credible sources that information on UAPs has also been withheld from Congress, which, if true, is a violation of laws requiring full notification to the legislative branch, especially as it relates to the four congressional leaders, the defense committees, and the intelligence committees. And so we'll, we'll of course, put all the links to uh, this night's show notes, so all the links to the news we covered in tonight's show in the show notes that usually happens tomorrow. And you'll have to go to anomalyarchives.org or look at the subsequent postings of tonight's show. We just never put them in this night's YouTube channel show notes or the wherever you might be looking at it. Meanwhile, there is so much to get into. So over at, we got word from the newparadigminstitute.org, that is Daniel Sheehan's organization, New Paradigm Institute and Visible College Partner to Support Yale Student UFO Society, First UAP Disclosure Teach-In. Again, this is from newparadigminstitute.org and is basically a press release, which is getting some mainstream distribution. Let's see. I, I forget exactly where, but let's see. I, I know I've, it's being covered in everywhere from Sacramento, California, Los Angeles, California, to Augusta, Georgia. In fact, let's see if I can bring that up here. I know I have it somewhere. So besides the press release over at the New Paradigm Institute for the first ever UFO UAP teach-in will be held on Friday, September 27th, 2024 at Yale University. It's unclear. It looks like this is going to be open to the public, but it looks like it's in person only. We've got an email out down to find out if there is going to be a live stream, but it does not look like that is the case. But like I said, this is getting some news coverage. Oh, here we go. Over at Augusta, Georgia, they they have reproduced the the press release for this. And oh, look at their cute little skull and bones alien. The Yale Student UFO Society has a cute little gray alien head with skull and bones beneath it. <laughs> but yeah, so such, again, news outlets as this WJBF.com, which appears to be an ABC affiliate in Augusta, Georgia, as well as KTLA, that would be the Los Angeles, what is that? I'm not sure if that's Fox or what, but they also are reproducing this. And then we've got a third link. I, there's, I'm sure there's more, but those are the ones that I noticed. Now, just jumping back for a second, if you are unfamiliar with the UAPDA, the UF, UAP Disclosure Act, you can go to uapcaucus.com slash uapda, and they have a rundown of the basics. If you're wondering about what is the nature of that legislation, as they point out here, the key points. Creates a centralized UAP records collection at the National Archives. Establishes an independent review board to oversee the disclosure process. Mandates the review and potential release of historical UAP records. Sets clear criteria for the postponement of disclosure when necessary. So there some of the contention in the UAPDA has been the imminent domain, the, the forced the handover of alleged UAP, UFO materials, property of whoever they might be in the hands of, these, these, these supposed black project 
secret programs, SAPs, special access programs, what are often referred to as the legacy pro programs, or other independent researchers who have these materials. They might be called upon to give it here, give it, hand it over to the to the the government. So that that has a, a few people up in arms, but. So yes, we mentioned this uh, newparadigminstitute.org announcement about this partnering with them and y the Yale Student UFO Society. And that this really caught my attention. The Visible College, of course, the Visible College is a phrase that has become more and more popularized, largely through, I'd say, the efforts of a religious professor, religious studies professor Diana Pasolka, post her book in, what was it 2019, when... Her first book, American Cosmic, came out, and she, of course, began interacting years before with the likes of Jacques Vallée, who Jacques Vallée and J. Allen Hynek had described their network of academic researchers interested in the UFO phenomena as the Invisible College, as a reference to the classic old, hundreds of years past, secret scientist organization that was trying to enlighten scientific research what in secret because of course the world was then ruled by churches that found it all rather heretical and at some point as i pointed out to diana in an email j allen hynek had said what we need is a visible college we need to take our invisible college and make it visible but of course until there's more mainstream acceptance of this that that can't happen well we have been watching since 2017 that happening for good or ill, you decide. But you can go to thevisiblecollege.org and learn more about this organization whose mission is our goal is to produce, collaborate on, curate, and share high quality research and educational materials that enable other researchers, policymakers, and the public to better understand this complex topic. We do not advocate for any particular conclusions, nor do we make any claims to exclusive knowledge or authority. Our group is bound only by our common commitment to open-minded, rigorous inquiry and by our belief that the best way to make progress is to work together in the open. Now, one of the things that caught my attention here <laughs> is, let's see, where is it? Now I'm not seeing it. Okay, well, somewhere on their website, they mentioned that they are not affiliated with any other organization that might have exist, existed pre, with the same name, the Visible College, previous to September 2024. So this is apparently a brand new launched organization. Obviously, there's been some time and energy put behind it. But I found that, that note interesting because, of course, I have owned a Visible College domain name for decades since, I think, like 1999 or 2000. Not that they were necessarily re referencing us and our efforts, but Anyway, but there's also this other organization, the YSUS, the Yale Student UFO Society, and they are over at yaleconnect.yale.edu slash YSUS slash home, and there's more information about them there. Interesting group of people. Sydney Morrison is the president, seems to be the main force behind this, and there again is that cute little <laughs> alien skull and bones. But yeah, check all that out. It'll be interesting to see. Hopefully, I'm assuming nowadays that it's standard practice that folks are going to, they are going to, you know, record this, this, this presentation, hopefully, and make that video available online. If they're not streaming it live, that it'll be put online eventually, but we'll keep you posted on that. And of course, we'll flip it over to the Flipboard and, and publicize that because very interested to see what comes of, of, of such efforts. All right, moving right along. Going to jump over to... Oh, yeah, so what else is going on in the U, UFO UAP world? Again, the New Paradigm Institute is going to be doing a global disclosure day because, of course, in the original... I don't know if it's legislation or what have you, but the the the... United States government's various alphabet agencies, they're all the organizations have been tasked with providing to Congress all their available information from their departments, their agencies, 
on UFOs. And the due date, I believe, was October 19th or 20th. And so New Paradigm Institute is declaring October 20th as Global, Global Disclosure Day. And you can sign up to be notified there. I believe it's, let's see, going to be an, a day-long streamed event with material about the subject their website says, we are very excited to announce the first Global Disclosure Day on October 20th, 1 p.m. Eastern. On this day, our citizens for disclosure groups in 43 states and around the world will convene watch parties for a two-hour live stream event. This first-of-its-kind event will feature notable speakers in the disclosure movement, testimonials from local activist groups, and special videos about the latest information on UAP. Yada, yada, we are witnessing a major sea change in the history of the UAP, UFO UAP campaign. Absolutely. Again, for better or worse, folks. But there's some other interesting events going on. This one isn't exactly UFO related, but I want to bring your attention to this. The edgarcasey.org website is is promoting their upcoming event, Ancient Mysteries and Cover Earth Secrets, Discover the Fascinating Realms of Ancient Knowledge, featuring world-renowned ancient mystery experts, including, I believe, yes, there we go, David Hatcher Childress, often described as the real world Indiana Jones, Jim Vieira, John Van Auken, Hugh Newman, Manu says, Seth Zada, Mark Antony, Christy George, Allison Ray, others, Laura Hoff. And you can find out more about this over at edgarcasey.org. And of course, we'll put it in the show notes. But jumping back to some more UFO news because there is just a lot of UFO news in tonight's lineup. Interesting long article here at the LA Review of Books. That's lareviewofbooks.org uh, from just a, a couple of days ago. Michael Sokolo has this article, Johnny Mac and the Unbelievable UFO Truth. Now, this article, I, it's, it's pretty harsh <laughs> on the the subject of alien abductions and it it reflects i i it accurately reflects the kind of derision that that experiencers abductees ufo encounters close encounter witnesses have have faced and of course john mack the harvard psychiatrist faced these this ridicule factor head on and tried to lend his his cachet, his his notoriety, his respectability to the subject, but the, it, this article reminds us that it is twenty years to the day on September twenty seventh when a John Mack was taken from the world due to his looking the wrong way on the road as he began to cross it in London one night when he was then struck by a drunk driver. He was 74 years old at the time, and he was there to accept an honor related to his Pulitzer Prize winning biography from 1977, the book, A Prince of Our Disorder, The Life of T.E. Lawrence. Now, this article does not really, I don't think it ever mentions the fact that uh, there's been this recent biography by Ralph Blumenthal, one of the authors who brought forth the OSAP ATIP Pentagon UFO program in the 2017 articles, along with Leslie Kane and Helen Cooper at the New York Times. But, and as I say, this this article is pretty much just recapping for those who aren't familiar that 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 controversial time as John Mack took so much flack from his peers and the media and everybody just laying so much ridicule and, and laughter upon his feelings of the importance of the UFO witnesses, the, the abduction experiencers. But there is, and then they, they, they mentioned the fact that the memory war is a, a title of a book at the time, how hypnosis rightly became the target of, of people's derision in terms of this is not necessarily the best tool. If it's really a bad tool, perhaps to use to uncover quote unquote truth and reality. But there's at least this one paragraph I wanted to read here, if I can find it again. There we go. Nope. Nope. Yeah, here we go. 
<clears throat> the tragic car accident in London 20 years ago erased popular memory of the public and institutional controversies spawned by Mac's quirky research. And first of all, I totally disagree with that, but that I'm somebody who's obsessed with and focused on the subject. So, Yet Mac's story lends relevant context to several of today's challenges in describing and communicating reality. In 2024, with discussion flourishing everywhere about misinformation, disinformation, and whether shared communicative realities can even exist, revisiting Mac's work offers timely lessons concerning the boundaries of inquiry, his quest to explore and tentatively confirm the veracity of stories so outlandish as to be almost laughable seemed almost humorous decades ago. That he appeared on the Oprah Winfrey show to discuss alien abduction only served to further distance his research from serious academic inquiry. Well, you know what? People watch these shows, whether you think highly of the, that kind of a show like Oprah Winfrey's and all the, the, the proliferation of, of, of those kinds of talk shows. They were popular. People are interested in, in these stories of people. And that is something that is severely lacking, as I've said repeatedly, in this new wave of, of UFO popularity is that we are hearing significantly less from the very experiencers, witnesses to these phenomena. Oh, yes, we might hear a military pilot describe what they saw with the canopy. And yes, sometimes they might open up about how that odd experience changed their life. But that's a very different thing than somebody who sees a ball of light come through the wall, morph into a being at the foot of their bed and proceed to instigate seemingly a wild array of nonsensical, outlandish, unbelievable experiences upon the witness. And it, it it's important to also remind folks that yes, Mac used hypnosis as did much worse abduction researchers than he. But the fact also remains that a large number of experiencers and abduction uh, abductees never undergo hypnosis, that they had conscious recall of their experiences. Now, those experiences often had as strange a tenor as those that emerge under hypnosis. And there are certainly no conclusions that should be jumped to regardless of whether hypnosis was used or not, other than hypnosis is not a lie detector test which is also incredibly fallible and a false named device. Anyway, you might want to take check this article out. It's it's lengthy. Like I say, it's a, it's it's quite dismissive and derisive, but I actually think despite that, it's a pretty good article reaffirming the history of of this important time when a, a very re reputable and respectable academic started looking into this important subject. Now, we, of course, in previous episodes have been talking a lot about Lou Elizondo's new book and how much press coverage he's getting. And I've, I've alluded to the fact that Jay Stratton, who worked with and over <laughs> Lou Elizondo, has got his own book coming out. And sure enough, Deadline.com is reporting HarperCollins acquires rights to bombshell memoir from Jay Stratton, former director of U.S. government's UAB task force and the pre previous incarnations. I don't know. The whole, his, the whole timeline is so convoluted. It's really hard to explain to anybody. And I get it all confused in my own head, so I'm not even going to try. But, and I have not had the chance to read this article, but I am very curious to hear this other person's version of the, the history and the timeline. Now, something a little more fun, perhaps, is this... This is the, the, the Google Translate version from the Spanish, I believe, over at ovniologia.com. Silent boomerang UFO filmed over Texas, a rare one. So basically there is this UFO video, I'm not going to play it, but basically what you see here is about all you get in the video. There is no information in the video image because of the way it's been cropped and edited to give you any sense of perspective. It's, it's, I mean, it could so easily be a hoax. I believe it's identified as having been seen over Amarillo. Oh, where does it say that? Does it say that? 
Am I misremembering? No, there we go. Mr. Miller, upon seeing the light passing through the darkness of the sky and violence, immediately filmed it using the zoom and making this impressive record. The video was filmed on August 5th, 2024 in Amarillo, Texas. It looks very much like the drawings of the alleged flying wing that was seen in the Phoenix Lights case back in the uh, mid to late 90s. And that in and of itself makes me wonder if it's a hoax imitating that. But interesting that the very final paragraph says the footage was sent to ufologist Philippe Van Putten, who shared it here with Ovniologio for the public. The video made available is an edited composition with cuts and highlights to facilitate analysis and study. Research has been conduct conducted to verify the authenticity of the recording. Well, I reached out to Philippe and said, oh, I, I understand that you have the original video or, or do you have the original video? He says he does not. So it makes me wonder, does he have just a copy or does he only have this edited version that was provided to him? Long story short, it's useless. I mean, hopefully somebody is following up with the alleged witness and can verify at least that this person really did experience this and, and record this. But the video is just classic. Like, don't just zoom in with your camera. Try to get whatever object you are recording in the frame with other objects like trees and streetlights and tops of houses, things that can be, or, or if you can at least even see the stars in the background, <clears throat> all these things can help in the later analysis of the footage. Now, not promoting this, but I was made aware of this post over at medium.com by somebody going by at escape velocity one. I think this is like a six part rambling quotathon, but there is some interesting information in here, but it's largely actually more of a parapolitical conspiracy diatribe than a UFO explication. But if you're if you've got the time and you're inclined to to wade through that kind of thing, you might give it a try. I believe all but maybe one of the parts, the six part articles are all available for free. Part one is George Bush, George H.W. Bush and UFO UAP secrecy. The UFO crash retrieval story is the biggest corruption case in modern history and involves the Nazi funded Bush family and others in their orbit who created the CIA to hide the UFO UAP program and make themselves global leaders via the oil business while hiding free energy and keeping us in forever wars. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of myself or the nonprofit that I represent. On the other hand, I, I, personally, there's a lot here that I'm like, yes, that's what this is what or I've been led in my belief system over the last 20, 30 plus years as a conspiracy researcher, parapolitical researcher, somebody who's investigated the the horrific history of the alphabet agencies, the military industrial complex, uh, the Bush regime, and their connections to the Nazis and the importation of Nazis after the World War II. There's some very interesting bits of information here. And if you aren't familiar with any of that, this could be a very good education. But as I say, it, it's a bit excessive in its quoting of various sources, and it, but it's trying to assemble a lot of the data points that have been been coming out through sources such as Daniel Sheehan and Lou Elizondo and others, and it it also reamplifies an idea that has been around for a while, but has apparently caught the zeitgeist in the last couple of weeks, which is this idea that Dick Cheney is at the head of the UFO octopus. Dick Cheney is the one who is still alive and active, who has had the, the deepest connections to the UFO espionage <laughs> underworld. Make of that what you will. And if, like I say, if you're interested, you can dive into this, but it's not pretty, folks, the, the history of, of these kinds of things in, in America. Now, let's see which. Ah, right, so jumping, I'm going to be jumping around a bit here and see if I can get rid of some of these tabs to help my computer along. So over at discovermagazine.com is this article, Is Ball Lightning Real? The Science Behind Nature's Strangest Light Show. Now, 
you know, this has been, this is one of those things. It's it's crazy to me that people still wonder if ball lightning it exists. Is it a real thing? And that's because it's like UFOs. We seemingly haven't been able to get it in the lab, reproduce it on demand, get good footage of it. Seems like every year or so, we get some footage that be- goes viral that purports to be ball lightning. There was the last one I remember seeing was some some train track footage that seemed to show a ball of light attributed as ball lightning rolling across the tracks, or maybe into the woods or something, which doesn't exactly sound like typical ball lightning behavior. But this article goes into just the, that strange the strange fact that it is not necessarily acknowledged as a real thing. and But if it is, the different theories that have been ascribed to explain how, how it works. Now, I've probably told this these stories a couple of times over the years, but I've had two near brushes with ball lightning or what was most likely ball lightning. Balls of light were seen nearby where I was on two different occasions, and unfortunately, I missed it both times. When I was in elementary school here in Austin, there is a place just outside of town called Pioneer Farms. It is a recreation of an old farm, an old village, to give people the the sense of life. It's kind of like a Ren Faire kind of environment, only it's not that far back. But just like what was life like on the prairie kind of a thing with haylofts and log cabins and that sort of thing, candle making activities, that sort of thing for, for the family, very family friendly fun. And our elementary school class, boys and girls were, were taken out for an overnight excursion to Pioneer Farms. The boys were relegated to the barn. So we had to sleep in the hay in the barn, just massive, at least to my small stature at the time, huge, tall, open air barn. And the young ladies, the the girls got to stay in the two-story log cabin, or rather the log cabin with a a loft as the second floor. And the story goes, we so that night there was a massive Texas thunderstorm, lightning, just really just a barn razor as it or just crazy, crazy storm. And the next day we were told or found, heard, and I've since confirmed this with some of the girls I'm still friends with from elementary school, that yes, indeed, a ball of light entered the the loft where the girls were. And the, everybody seemed to just agree this, is, this was ball lightning. I mean, there's a su- thunderstorm, but ball lightning doesn't always coincide with thunderstorms, though typically... There's at least some kind of thunderstorm activity in the distance. So there was that instance where like, I'm like, I don't know, a hundred yards or less away from where this occurred, but didn't know about it till the next day. Then years later, as a young adult, post high school, I'm visiting some friends out just outside of Austin near one of the lakes. And we'd gone down away from the house to this depression this kind of bowl-like depression in the ground that was on the path leading to the river, the lake. Didn't really go past that is my memory of it. And then I left. (laughs) So I actually wasn't really close by when this happened. But shortly after I left the party, some friends were down in that same area and saw a ball of light moving against the wind and there had been, again, like the threat of thunderstorms, because I remember they had a trampoline next to the house. And I remember jumping on the trampoline and being worried that, like, maybe I shouldn't be jumping up to the air when there's lightning about to occur in the area. It just seemed like a dangerous activity. Plus, you know, the metal springs and of the, the metal frame of the trampoline just seemed dangerous to me. But, yeah, ball lightning was seen within an hour or so of my leaving that area. So sadly, I still not seen balls of light like that. So we'll put the link to that. Is ball lightning real? The science behind nature's strangest light show that links to discovermagazine.com. On a similar note, we have, have I used up my free 
popularmechanics.com mysterious plasma bubbles have appeared over the pyramids china caught these strange atmospheric phenomena on advanced radar but they aren't aliens well of course not now this article talks about a type of radar long range ionospheric radar l-a-r-i-d that the chinese have for powerful low latitude long range sensing located on the hainan h-a-i-n-a-n island and that it has detected plasma bubbles above the Midway Islands and the pyramids of ancient Egypt. Now, this isn't that, this isn't what I thought it was going to be, but the article says, on August 27th, the Institute of Geology and Geophysics, a part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, announced that LARID, L-A-R-I-D, detected these plasma bubbles during a solar storm back in early November of 2023. With a detection range of nearly 6,000 miles, LARID can detect these bubbles as far as Hawaii in the east or Libya in the west by blasting high-powered electromagnetic waves into the ionosphere, which can then bounce along vast distances. Now, it, it describes that we have different technique for tracking these anomalies. NASA has its global scale observations of the LIM and DISC, the GOLD mission, basically a satellite appendage attached to a commercial satellite to track potential EPBs across the Earth. While GOLD, GOLD, often detected bubbles during periods of intense disturbance, such as solar storms and volcanic eruptions, the mission detected bubbles during relatively quiet atmospheric moments as well and showcased that there's more to learn about these mysterious bubbles. Now, they go on to say, basically, that the the Chinese are also saying, oh, by the way, this, this can help us uh, detect military aircraft. According to reports from official Chinese media, over the horizon, military radars using similar technologies have been widely deployed by the Chinese military and have detected targets, including F-22 stealth fighter jets. Which makes me wonder about this other article over at futurism.com. They're section called the bite b-y-t-e chinese researchers say they can detect stealth aircraft using starlink satellites not going to go too much into this other than to say it, it's it's kind of like what the other thing was referring to and this just gets into the kind of advanced sensing technology that is available to our governments and their militaries paid for with our tax dollars the ones that are ours which could be brought to bear on trying to detect such things as UFOs, UAP. Let's see. And I'm going to just keep jumping here quickly to these other articles over at SmithsonianMag.com. Rare jaw fossils discovered in Texas shed light on a 20-foot-long mosasaur unearthed last year. The remains could reveal new information on the extinct sea reptile, which crushed mollusks and shelled creatures with its large, round teeth. There's a nice artist rendering there and with some actual photographs of the jawbones, which have these knobby, as they say, nubby, rounded teeth still attached. Love this kind of stuff being found here in, in Texas. And the article says, Mosasaurs went extinct at the same time as the dinosaurs similarly killed off by the ecological effects of a large asteroid colliding with Earth around 66 million years ago. And also here in Texas, we have this from, what is this website? Penews, P-E-N, News. Chupacabra caught on camera? Alien presence in Texas leaves experts stumped. Yeah, game camera footage, we all know, can be very deceiving. But you often get some very strange things on these camera images. This article says a mysterious creature has been branded a chupacabra in a skinwalker after its photo was captured by a trail cam. Michael Dumas Demel knew nothing, knew something was off when he checked his trail cam near Dubina, a rural community in the U.S. state of Texas. He said, I have three different cameras at the three different hunting areas. They catch coyote, deer, bobcats, rabbits, raccoons, and foxes. I look at approximately 100 plus pics a day from the three cameras, but that was the only photo that it showed up on. My first reaction was something doesn't look right, so I stopped on the picture to zoom in. You know, it, it does look weird, but I mean, again, these are game cameras. They're not usually high resolution. Of course, they're night vision, so that's, that's also detracting from it. Yeah, just looks like it could just be just about anything, really. And most quote-unquote chupacabras in Texas turn out to usually be Coyotes with mange, 
or possibly hairless dogs that are of a certain variety. There's been some other weird stuff cited as well, but hey, there he is. There's the guy that took the picture. Let's see. Oh, it mentions, as for a potential ID, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department drew a blank. A spokesperson said, I reached out to our mammologist, and due to the quality of the image, a positive identification of the animal is not possible. Meanwhile, the Texas Parks and Wildlife YouTube channel has a nearly nine-minute video about Texas Bigfoot and a historic Texas cryptid sighting. I highly recommend this. There's some some rare archival footage of from from reporting on the Greer Island monster that was this kind of hairy, maybe goat-like critter that allegedly threw a tire at passersby in a in a, a park that I think is called Greer Island. There's a lot of of material in this episode featuring our. Texas cryptozoologists like Lyle Blackburn and our good friend Craig Woolheater, who hosts the Texas Bigfoot Conference in Jefferson, Texas. Of course, he also has started putting on, and today, this this year was, I believe, the third year, the Texas UFO Conference. He also does a Bigfoot film festival. But yeah, the a new T, TPW, Texas Parks and Wildlife, had been working on this for some time, and it is now available on their their website and you might enjoy taking a look at that oh did i skip some other things i think i did oh my god a whole other raft of tabs and okay okay folks well here is let's see this th- these will go quickly right sure they will so you know we've been reporting on professor simon talking about the alleged detection of a civilization signal from old SETI at home processed data and how this is leaking out slowly in the form of mainstream articles talking about the billions, if not trillions of dollars that are being poured into new efforts at detecting civilization signatures in radio telescope data. This fun podcast, Psychoactivo podcast, that's P-S-I-C-O Activo podcast. This host has been reporting on that as well, saying that he is also in contact with people who are more or less saying the same thing as him. He's about, done about two or three different videos on this one. This one's for number number 140, James Webb's new discovery prompts briefing to Congress, people on the mystery of the UFO. Looks, looks pretty interesting. And here's another one of those mainstream articles over at Forbes.com. New search begins for alien super civilizations in 2,800 galaxies. Astronomers have begun a first-of-its-kind search for signs of techno-signatures produced by super civilizations, those more advanced than ours, in galaxies beyond the Milky Way. So, again, this is... It seems like the SETI thing is really expanding, and it many people who believe that we are being acclimatized to the idea of big D disclosure suggest that it's little things like this that are that are priming the pump. Of course, you know, this is a vastly different situation than claiming that extraterrestrial or other non-human off-world entities are here interacting with us and causing sightings or close encounters, but it's it's something. Back at futurism.com's The Bite, and we got another link in the flipboard to a different article about this. Man spots secret U.S. military spacecraft with amateur telescope, which just goes to the point of how amateur civilian scientists can can make discoveries. <laughs> just six weeks after spotting a secret Chinese space plane, an amateur astronomer in Australia is back at it again. Excuse me, in Austria is back at it again. In an interview with Space.com, Skywatcher Felix Strofbanker described how he came to capture imagery of Pentagon craft that nobody knows much about. And moving right along. So our good friend Aaron Golius, who hopefully will be giving a presentation in the coming months for the Anomaly Academy cadet tier of Patreon supporters, recently revised. He's celebrating his seven, more than seven years of doing his Saucer Life podcast. I highly recommend his his podcast. 
I think it's it's a great exploration of classic cases, classic UFO literature. Less, it's not really about the modern stuff. He occasionally makes some off comments about the current state of ufology, UAPology. But he years ago put out a list of what he thought were the most important UFO book, and he's recently revised that. So the list, his original list, includes Flying Saucer Serious Business. The UFO Controversy in America, which was, I believe, the first his professor, academic his, historian by Professor David Jacobs on the UFO phenomena, which now there's the, after the Flying Saucers came by Greg Agigian. The Mothman Prophecies, woohoo, by John Keel. Flying Saucer Occupants, Messengers of Deception by Jacques Vallée, Communion, of course, by Streber. They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, Flying Saucers Have Landed. The Interrupted Journey about the Betty and Barney Hill case, and the UFO Experience, of course, J. Allen Hynek's book. So, update. I recently added the books below to the list and deselected the three struck through above. Now, you can't actually see which ones he struck through, so I'm not sure, but look at what he added. Project Beta by Greg Bishop and Saucers, Spooks, and Kooks by Adam Go Rightly. Could not agree more. Project Beta came out in 2005 about the Paul Benowitz affair. Saucer Spooks and Kooks came out in the last couple of years by our good friend Adam Gorightly. That's a great explication of the the UFO scene of the 80s and 90s. And of course, Jack Brewer's Wayward Sons about the intelligence communities the shenanigans in the UFO scene, as well as I was kind of surprised to see this Into the Fringe by Carla Turner. Carla Turner one of my favorite abduction researchers who sadly is no longer with us, but really, you know, way to go, Aaron, for doing an update on these classic books and adding a few more modern books. <laughs> I, I guess, really, it's only Wayward Sons by Jack Brewer and Saucers, Spooks, and Kooks by Adam Go Rightly that are recent books, but they certainly aren't necessarily about the current wave of interest in a UAP, which is fine by me. All right. And you can find this over at saucerlife.com. Meanwhile, I only just found Greg Bishop's presentation to the National Museum of Language from several months ago, a presentation on alien writing. Of course, this is a subject that he's been fascinated on since finding out about the uh, amazing Mario Pasiglini, who was a an experiencer, possibly an abductee or possibly a contactee. It's hard to say because he Pasiglini really didn't talk about his own experiences, at least not very much publicly. I'm still making my way through this a nearly two hour lecture by Greg to this National Museum of Language, which apparently was founded by somebody from the NSA. Now, so it's it's really also very interesting. I don't I, I suspect that this is perhaps one of the most esoteric presentations this this museum organization has ever hosted, but that's just a guess. But love to to see my friend Greg talk about subjects that he is so excited and interested in. And you can go check that out for free over at the NML Podioma. YouTube channel. Again, we'll have the links in the show notes, which will be posted in about a day or so. So check that out. Meanwhile, speaking of Jack Brewer and his cohort, Erica Lukes, they, of course, are hard at work over at their nonprofit, expandingfrontiersresearch.org. And they've put out this very brief seven minute video in a nice article about this 1950s psychological warfare, Intel collection, UFOs, and fascism. Very interesting. So based on documentation that they've obtained through the Freedom of Information Act, they are just pointing out the information that they've found related to the founders of NICAP, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena, one of the original big civilian UFO research organizations, which surprisingly hmm, had a lot of psychological warfare people involved in it. And there's some very interesting 
data that they present in, in this article and the video. So I really urge you to go check that out. Sticking with the material being unearthed by archives around the world, we have the CBC News Saskatchewan YouTube channel has released this uh, this archival video, Unexplained Phenomena in Small Town Saskatchewan 50 Years Ago. Were there UFOs seen in Langenberg? And I believe this and the other video I'm about to, to point you to have everything from UFO sightings to crop circles to cattle mutilations. So there's not just this one, which was, I believe, this was released six days ago. And then there's this other one, originally broadcast November 4th, 1996, from the archives, Was There Extraterrestrial Activity in Sask? Now, this one, I think, is a lot shorter. And one of these features like a kind of a podcast beginning and ending, I think. But, man, I just, I'm so glad that there are archives putting out this kind of material Way to go, folks. And again, sticking with this and relevant to everything having to do with UFOs, UAP, the U.S. National Archives YouTube channel has put out Eisenhower's Military Industrial Complex Speech Origins and Significance. This is actually, this has been online for about 13 years, but I had not seen this. It's about three minutes long and goes into how important this speech has become how important it was at the time, how it was developed as the speechwriter confirming that as much as he did work on it, that it was really the the inspiration of President Eisenhower as he left office. And it is such an important speech. And if you've never heard it, you absolutely owe it to yourself to take a listen. And again, continuing the archiving of classic UFO-related material, this one's from UFO B, your UAP library, 1966. Gerald Ford urges for congressional inquiry into UFOs. Of course, Gerald Ford has his own unique part to play in the UFO history and its legacy. He did, of course, try to get to the bottom of this subject and tried to get congressional hearings. And this is some archival audio. It's only about an hour, excuse me, a minute and 15 seconds or so. A bit longer and very much worth the the time is, of course, the Jesse Michaels recent video, Aerospace, Aerospace's Secret Search for Anti-Gravity, where he has a great interview with Nick Cook. Of course, Nick Cook wrote the fantastic and very, very important book, the hunt for zero point. And this is the illustration here of a hovering cigar shaped object with a pilot coming out and a person who looks like a landing crew or a UFO witness greeting them. And this was the illustration that accompanied the article that started him on his path to investigating as a Jane's defense weekly aviation magazine article, investigative journalist, and I'm not sure if he was an editor, I forget exactly, but I mean, he was a bigwig in mainstream aviation military circles. And for him to do the deep dive that he did and the resulting work is very important. And if you haven't read The Hunt for Zero Point, you absolutely owe it to yourself to do so. He, like people like Leslie Kane and, and many others, I suppose, and Robert Bigelow, billionaire Bigelow, has also transitioned to having also another interest area besides UFOs and all the many things that, that might be entree to, uh, has, has gotten also interested in the afterlife and communicating with the dead. So interesting parallels between Nick Cook, Leslie Kane, and Robert Bigelow there. Let's see, where am I at here? I'm almost done. Almost. So many of you might be familiar with next door. Oh no, go back. Wait, did it just, oh, there it goes. Hold on folks. So in my neighborhood or, or a couple miles away from me is a local, how you say, coffee shop. And it's a, it's a, it's a hemp marijuana oriented coffee shop called Radix, R-A-D-I-X 
coffee. And I was recently made aware that they have this giant, like, I don't know, is that like eight, nine, 12 feet tall animatronic alien and that is being used to promote the their their coffee location. And here is a, vi- a little snippet of a video of, of it moving around with its, uh, and it's got some cheesy like theremin or kind of sound effects or something, but just kind of fun and cute. Uh, let's see. Moving right along. Getting close to the end here. I swear to God. Over at artnet.com in their news section, bikers and off-roaders are endangering ancient Chilean geoglyphs. This is sad. And as this involves, here again, the Atacama Desert. There are more than 5,000 geoglyphs there in that desert. Bikers and off-roaders are endangering ancient Chilean geoglyphs. You know, I you know, I, I certainly don't begrudge people having their fun with off off road all terrain vehicles as noisy as it can often be and as as damaging to the environment as they may be. It's 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 horrific to me that they would be destroying these ancient lines. These geometric, zoomorphic, and anthropomorphic figures may be less celebrated than their Peruvian counterparts, the Nazca lines, but they remain protected Chilean monuments, ones facing a serious threat from humanity, from human activity, according to the region's cultural activists. At Alto Barranco in the Tarapeca region, an area in the far north of Chile, the most persistent damage comes from motorcycles and 4x4 vehicles whose tire tracks are erasing the geoglyphs. This is just so anger-inducing. Spread over an area of roughly 100 square miles, the more than 5,000 Atacama Desert Jubilus were made by pre-Hispanic peoples between 1,000 CE and 1540 CE. Often created on the side of hills, they were made by removing the top layer of rock to remove a lighter underlying soil. It is thought they served as a guide to passing travelers. And in a similar vein, the debrief.org ran this a couple of days ago. Look, over 300 new Nazca lines. Oops, wait, did I not click it? Here we go. Oh, over 300 new Nazca lines geoglyphs have been revealed by AI. So they're using, this is a great use of artificial intelligence to help detect information that, that human eyes may not be as easily able to see. Though I bet if you were on psychedelics, you might you might see it. So this one's reported by Christopher Plain. Some interesting new designs I'd never seen before, including one that they describe as an orca with a knife. And then this one, human and animal geoglyph. I like that one. It kind of looks like a goofy dancing human or alien with kind of a big head alien. And some almost giant monkey looking thing. Now, where is the, and there's this bird one and oh yes. Another animal one looks very much like something from an anime piece. Ah, yes, here we go. The orca with a knife. <laughs> oh, I love it. That's great. And then another one, orca with a headdress. Well, that's over at the debrief.org. And on a similar note, there's this article over at deadbutdreaming.wordpress.com, the entopic model bridging ancient art and consciousness. And this basically has to do with rock art. Oh, here we go. Click on the link there. There you go. And this one's over at, I say, yeah, deadbutdreaming.wordpress.com. And it's, it's just talking about this, the interior origins of the kinds of shapes and lines that people see and that is believed to have informed this kind of paleolithic art, rock art. You might find that interesting. Well, I think that's going to do it for tonight, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, you can tune in. Let's see. Oh, getting all kinds of weird messages over here. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And good night.